Hello folks. Today we're going to take a look at some fundamentals for our electrical circuit theory. And the first thing we want to do is start with a model for an atom. What do we have there? Now it's very typical to see something drawn like this where we have a nucleus and then these nice little electron pad zipping around. Looks cute, very common, not particularly, particularly accurate. Electrons do not move in these nice elliptical orbits in a planar fashion. In fact, if you could see them, you can't. They're too small, obviously, but if you could, it would look probably more like a uh, a cloud of bees around a hive. More of this sort of like cloudy kind of thing, right? This sort of fuzzy mass zipping around. Well, what do we actually have, you know, as far as a model is concerned? Well, certainly we do have protons and neutrons. So I'll just draw a couple little dots here. And what we know is that the protons have a positive charge and the neutrons have no charge. Around this we have electrons but not in this shape. So you could imagine uh, maybe a sphere, you'd have all these electrons sort of zipping around and they don't follow a nice path. It's much more sort of chaotic looking to the human eye. Now, the only difference between some electrons that are sitting out here and our protons from our perspective is the fact that these guys have a negative charge. Now, there are a lot of other differences. The mass of a, uh, of a proton is about 2,000 times that of an electron. The mass of a neutron is about the same as that of a proton. So most of the mass of, uh, of an atom is, in fact, in the nucleus. The electrons make up you know, uh, less than 0.1% of the total mass. And it's the number of protons that you have that make the thing what it is. In other words, hydrogen, the simplest, has one proton. That's what makes it hydrogen. You know, helium has two protons. Copper has 29 protons. That's what makes this. Now, the number of neutrons can vary. So there's a sort of a most common version there are what are called isotopes, where you might have more uh, neutrons. And then the number of electrons should match the number of protons. If that's not the case, if, for example, we apply some external energy to this, we could sort of strip electrons off, um, we have what's called an ion. So if there are uh, more electrons or fewer electrons than there are protons, we call that an ion. Now, what about the sort of relative scale of these things? You, to be honest, you can't really draw it. You can't draw this thing to scale. The mass of a proton or neutron is on the, on the order of 10 to the minus 24th grams. It's crazy, crazy small. There are more uh, molecules of water in a, uh, a glass of, of, of water than there are glasses of water in all the oceans on the planet. The radius of a proton is around 10 to the minus 15 meters. Now, the nearest electron, right, zipping around here, is about 5... Uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. Well, that ratio is about 60,000 to 1. If you, if you look um, at a golf ball, 
and you say this golf ball represents an electron, how far away is that nucleus? Right? If I had you know, hydrogen, the simplest thing, there's one proton out there, how far away is it? This golf ball is approximately 1,200 meters or three quarters of a mile away. So you can picture this thing zipping around in a sphere, which would be the simplest orbital. And at the center of that thing is our nucleus. And, you know, the diameter of this is a mile and a half. Okay, that's mostly nothing when you think about it, you know. And that's true if you have not just, you know, hydrogen gas, that's true if you have something solid like silicon or copper. It's mostly nothing. Right? Nice and solid. It's mostly nothing. When you pick up something, what you're feeling is the, is the uh, uh, electrical charges, the, the repulsion, if you will, from those subatomic particles. Now, getting back to this, you know, I've sort of mentioned this idea of an electron zipping around in a sphere. Um, that's a possibility. It's the simplest possibility, right? We know it's not this, right? We have a series of shells that the electrons are organized in. So we have uh, subshell numbers, you know, n is one, two, three, and so forth. And then inside there we have subshells. And we give those letter names. S, P, D, F, and so forth. Now, the number of electrons that can fit in a given shell is equal to two n squared. And these will fill from low energy to high energy. So S will be filled first, then P, then D, and so forth. So when we look at this, the organization that we would have, right, if N is 1, we can have 2 in the first shell. If N is 2, we have 8 in the next shell. And then you know, 3 squared, we have 18 in the next shell. So if you were to look at something like copper, right, an obvious conductor, you would find this thing has 29 protons and electrons. The first shell would be filled. The second shell would be filled. The third shell would be filled, right? That would get you 28. And then you'd have one lone electron out here in the last shell. And it's that one lone electron that makes copper such a good conductor because an external uh, energy source can basically move that electron out and we have free electron flow. Okay, we're talking about charge. I kind of hopped over that, right? That's a term lots of people use. Well, what is charge? We say that this is positively charged, that's negatively charged. You know, all protons are indistinguishable from other protons. All neutrons are identical. All electrons are identical. The only thing we know so far, yeah, there's a mass difference, but there's a charge difference. So like, what, what is charge? Well, Charge is, is uh, a characteristic. It's not a, not a characteristic like, um, you know, mass, or you could look at a person and say, you know, you have blue eyes. Uh, it's more like saying someone has an attractive personality. You know, it's a characteristic, but it's not this obvious kind of um, physical thing that we're used to at, at, at a human scale. But the magnitude of the charge of an electron and a proton are the same. Opposite charges attract. And like charges repel. So if like charges repel, why, why doesn't the nucleus here fly apart? Well, there's something called a strong nuclear force that keeps this bound together. And the electrons, of course, are in motion. So you could imagine that that motion is preventing them from actually collapsing in. But if we have an external energy source, we can, as I said, move these electrons into higher shells. And what ends up happening 
is uh, we can absorb energy or the other way around we can get electrons to fall into lower energy orbitals which will emit energy that's for example how an led would work so we get an electron to drop and it emits a photon at a particular wavelength in other words at a particular color of light and you know we have a red led or a yellow led or you know whatever the heck it is okay okay now the lowest level on this thing right the simplest uh, uh, orbital is in fact spherically shaped but as we move up the shapes get the shapes get really crazy so you could have something that looks like a dumbbell or like a cloverleaf kind of thing and those are basically probability contours you know you don't really know where the electron is at any given po point in time but you kind of know generally speaking where it's likely to be in this you know movement right not exactly the same thing as you know what we have over here right considerable difference all right to make life a little easier because trying to draw that would just be insane there are some diagrams in the textbook um, but to make life a little easier we use an energy level model which is called the Bohr model named after Niels Bohr physicist in which case what we do is um, we draw the nucleus and usually what we'll do here is um, we'll just put the atomic number you know the, the number of, uh, of uh, protons that we have and then I'll just for our sake I'll just put an N there for nucleus and then we'll draw these orbitals now this is an energy level diagram so I got some electrons out here this is an energy level diagram it's not trying to make a, a physical picture of what's actually going on here so as we move out the energy levels are higher and higher and higher and if we get an electron to drop from you know one orbital to the next it's going to radiate out a photon right? going to radiate out energy so that um like I said, we could make something like an LED. Okay. All right. Getting back to our electron, because, you know, we have these, hopefully these electrons sitting out here in the outer shell, like copper, we can get them to move around. What's the quantity for charge? Well, charge is measured in coulombs. And it's given the symbol Q. The charge on one electron is tiny, like we're talking maybe, oh, around 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. That's pretty small. So it takes about roughly. 6.24 billion billion electrons to get you one coulomb All right crazy crazy tiny it is in fact the movement of charge that tells us what current is so we refer to that as the intensity i current electrical current is nothing more than the rate of charge movement or charge transfer however you want to think of that All right, so we use i for intensity and the rate of charge transfer would be q over t charge over time so we can then define one amp of current as one coulomb and one second so if you could imagine here's a wire and there's a current flowing through it now imagine sort of cutting this wire Right. 
And if you could count, like you get a little toll gate here, and you can actually count the electrons as they were going through, you could, knowing the charge on each one, you could figure out what the total charge is, and you know, a second or a minute or whatever the heck it is, um, divide it out, and you could come up with a current. So if we said that uh, in a tenth of a second, all right, we transfer you know, through this wire, uh, let's say two coulombs of charge, then the resulting current must be two coulombs over 0.1 seconds. So that's a 20 amp current. You know, which is the size of like a, a breaker uh, in, in your uh, in your house okay you know, so you have a, uh, a breaker for your uh, you know, kitchen appliances or something at 20 amps 15 amps that's fairly typical for that that size however we use circuits where, where currents are measured in the milliamps na uh, microamps nanoamps very very small values All right so basically, that's all that current is. You know, you could think of this, you know, like a lot of people like a, a water uh, analogy. So water, you'd think in terms of like gallons per minute. So it's a quantity in time. And that's basically what's going on here. We just think in terms of charge. Electrons are the charge carrier. Moving along, right? Certain amount in a certain amount of time. So if it's the same amount in a shorter period of time, the current's higher. You know, if it's uh, 20 gallons per minute, and then we shift that to 20 gallons per second, obviously that's a much more intense, a much greater current. Okay, so that's our first definition. Now you know what current is. All right, so the other big thing that everybody hears about, but, you know, vaguely only have a clue about what it really is, is voltage. When we talk about voltage, what is voltage? Well, voltage basically has to do with a potential difference. Some people like a sort of a pressure analogy for this. I like to use height as an analogy for, for voltage. Um, we can talk about energy. What is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. And uh, we usually denote that with a W for work. And there are many different units, for example, calories, uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, the one that we use is the joule. That's a standard SI unit, the joule. Now, we can break this apart into sort of two types. We have kinetic energy or energy of motion, and we have potential energy, which is energy by virtue of position. And if you're going to talk about potential energy, it's usually denoted with an equation MGH. Mass times gravity times height. So you could think of... So this is ground. It's green. It's like little grass. Okay. So you could think of an object sitting out here. And it's a certain distance up. All right, that's its height. And it has a certain mass, m. And of course, if we're sitting on Earth, you know, there's a certain gravitational constant associated with that. So if you let that thing go and it falls, right, that's energy of position, by virtue of position. And as it falls, it turns into kinetic energy, energy of motion. So when that hits the ground, you know, work can be done. You know, if it's just a, a ball or a brick or something and you drop it, you know, it just makes some noise. It puts a dent in the ground or, you know, whatever the heck is down here. It's not useful in our normal parlance, but, you know, physically that's what's actually going on. So you can increase the potential energy by really doing two things here. Taking this thing higher or increasing its mass. Now we can say in general, the potential energy is correlated to it's proportional to what that height is so more height means more potential energy but by itself 
height doesn't really indicate that there's a lot of energy or only a little energy. So here's what I mean. You could take an object like a ping pong ball and put it 10 feet up in the air and drop it on somebody, you know, hit them right on the head. Is that going to give them a concussion? No, it's a ping pong ball. You know, there's, there's really no mass. It's minimal mass. So it's high up, it's 10 feet up, but not a lot of mass. So the total potential energy is pretty small. On the other hand, if you replace that ping pong ball with um, a brick, okay, a cinder block, let's say, you drop that on someone's head 10 feet up, well, you might kill them, right? So there's a lot of energy associated with that. Even if that cinder block was only a foot up instead of 10 feet up, you could still seriously injure that person, okay? So just because the height is big doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of uh, oomph, let's say, behind it. And this is also true with voltage. So voltage is really nothing more than uh, a, a question of how much energy does it take to move charge from one point to another. So I'll just say, look, here's, a, here's point A and here's B. And I want to move charge A to B. So we have to throw some energy in here to do that. I would say basically that um, the voltage, the potential of B is higher than A after this process occurs. So the, uh, the voltage, the potential difference, is simply measured as that ratio of work, W, over the charge, Q. And we would say, for a definition, one volt is one joule to move one coulomb. I put in one joule, move one coulomb, the potential difference between those two points is one volt. So with my little height analogy, you could be talking about a very high voltage, right? Let's say, you know, 5,000 volts. If the charge is very small, then that means it doesn't require a lot of energy to get it there. It's like moving the ping pong ball up. So you can have a high voltage, which is not necessarily, in our case, deadly. You could easily have 5,000 volts on your body, static. Uh, you know, in the winter, you're wearing maybe some micro fleece or something like that. You pull it off and you hear that crackling noise, right? So that's a potential that you've developed on there as you're pulling off through triboelectric effect. You're literally scraping electrons from one surface to the other and you build up this potential and if that potential is greater than what the air can withstand, the breakdown potential, which is something we'll talk about later on, um, you get a little spark. Right? So all of those little crackly noises you hear are little tiny sparks. They're like, you know, lightning at a really, really tiny scale. Or you could think of lightning as that same thing on a much, much, much more grand scale. Um, on the other hand, you could have a modest voltage, but there's an appropriate uh, charge, a large charge, which would then indicate a large energy input, a big number of joules, and that could be deadly. All right. Okay. So those two things work together, right? So we've got our current and we've got our voltage. Now, continuing. Power. This is a fun word. I like this word. A lot of people confuse power and energy. They're related, but they're not the same thing. Power is the rate of energy usage. In other words, power, P, measured in watts, is 
is a question of W versus T. Right? The rate of energy usage, how quickly do we absorb that? So here's an idea. I said energy. Yeah, we use the joule, but you could also use something like calories. You know, if I say a banana is 75 calories, what is that? That's an energy source for a human being. You could think of a banana as like a little battery for a human. So you eat that, you get 75 calories worth of energy. It doesn't matter how fast you eat it. It's 75 calories. It's a pool of energy. Now that 75 calories can allow you to do several different things. That might be enough for you to, you know, walk a mile in 20 minutes. It might be enough for you to, you know, run a little short of a mile in maybe six minutes. Well, the latter is a higher power output because we're using that amount of energy in a shorter period of time. Okay, so if you take that pool of energy and you use it up very quickly, high power output. If you kind of stretch it out over time, right, you'd be very careful about that, sipping it, if you will, power output's very low. Well, here's an interesting thing. If you multiply current by voltage, current is Q over T. Voltage is W over Q. And what you see is the Q's cancel and you wind up with W over T. In other words, current times voltage is power. This is called power law. Very important. You can have a high voltage, current's really small, not a lot of power. You can have really high current, voltage small, not a lot of power. You get a modest current and a modest voltage, that can turn into a pretty good sized power. So as an example, if you had uh, an old-fashioned incandescent light bulb, and really, who uses those anymore? But it was 60 watts, and you live in North America, so that your system voltage, right, your house voltage is 120 volts. If you just divide those out, right, you can see that your current must be 120 volts, 60 watts, Current must be half an amp. Okay.